Women have taken combat roles in Iraq and Afghanistan despite policy that forbids it. Many are also dealing with trauma after war. Learn what programs are helping our service women when they return to civilian life. Next on Living Smart. I'm Patricia Gross. Welcome to Living Smart, the show designed to help you get the most out of life. A captain in the United States Marine Corps for 17 years in active duty, Katerina Fagrin served in 1991 in Desert Storm and 2006 in Fallujah, Iraq. She's one of the thousands of women who returned with post-traumatic stress syndrome. It wasn't until she moved to Houston that she attended the Wiser program at the VA hospital here. The program helps women who have undergone PTSD, substance dependence, anxiety and mood disorders, or military sexual trauma. NPR reports one out of three women in the U.S. military get raped. In Iraq, a military woman was more likely to be attacked by a fellow soldier than be killed by enemy fire. Today, Katerina Fagering, a professional photographer, writer, poet, blogger, and mom, speaks out to help other women cope and thrive in their new lives at home. In her book, The Art and Soul of Dancing Barefoot, she desires to facilitate a shift in consciousness about the world's perceptions and the value of girls. Captain Fagren, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. You decided to join the Marine Corps right after high school. Why did you do that? Uh, well, essentially it was to escape that lifestyle, to escape my, my home. It wasn't conducive for, for my growth, and, um, and I hadn't made any plans for anything else. Why the Marine Corps and not the Army or, or Air Force? I mean, when you think of the Marine Corps, it's really tough. Yeah. It is. Um, I think because they were the, they had the most integrity. Um, they, they, they were sort of no, um, they weren't sending me a sales pitch right, or anything. Right. They you were trusted just, them more. I did because they basically said they weren't going to promise me anything, but if I wanted to be a Marine, I could be a Marine. Now, I would assume that being a Marine is tough for men, much tougher for women. Is it? Uh, yes, it is. In, in what sense? Well, we, first of all, there's a sense that we're, we're unwanted and that we're the weaker link. And um, so every day we have to prove ourselves. And even if we were, you know, the fastest, the strongest for a good year, if we had a day that we just didn't, things weren't just clicking, then again, we would be thought of as weak. So it's, it's almost an ongoing, you know, hourly, daily effort. Do you think that when you join a military as a woman, you have to be tougher than a guy? Well, I don't think you have to and be And obviously, it's your personal experience. I mean, it must yeah. be different for everyone, but yes. we are talking about your own personal experience. Absolutely. I, I don't think you have to be tougher than a guy. I think, I think you have to um, be at least as tough as and, and hide any emotions or um, any sense of weakness. Right. right. Now, we keep hearing that women are not supposed to serve in combat, but because right. there are no front lines, right. women are serving in combat. Absolutely. Do you think women should serve in combat? Um, I do. I do. I think that they um, have an inherent um, purpose there. I think that with the way the wars are, are turning, um, we need to have women to be able to speak to the other women to provide that kind of insight. However, at the same time, I think that the women need to be trained a lot better. I was going to say they're not, yeah. they're not, because they're not supposed to be in combat, they're not trained to be in combat, yet they end up in situations where they are in combat. Right. And how do you get ready for that? Right. I mean, and, and that's not to say that all, all the women that are over there aren't trained fully. They're, I would say probably the majority of them are. But say you came from a reserve unit, you were in college, your reserve unit gets called up, and maybe you, you don't know how to um, become a, you know, the, the gunner of a Humvee and you don't know how to run a 50 cal because you did one drill three years ago on how to do it. Um, you know, that scenario could easily happen when you're on a convoy and if the gunner was taken out and you were the, the person to do it, you know, you would need to know how. And I know you saw that happen. Yeah. You saw some of your friends uh, live through that. You had a very interesting job in Iraq because you had to work with the women. Tell me what you did there. Well, um, me and a few other women Marines, um, namely, um, Gunnery Sergeant Julia Watson started this program called Iraqi Women Engagement Program. We got it bought off by the by the generals, and then we started conducting um, these engagements. And basically, what we did was we went out into town, found homes, um, asked permission to speak to the women, 
and um, went in and, and basically had tea with them. Of course, I'm skipping a lot of steps. Sure, yeah, yeah. Um, the it's houses, not that easy. <laughs> no, the houses had to be cleared, right, and, right. and the women had to realize that we were women after we took our um, helmets off, but, but generally it was very positive, and um, we had a great time. And the idea wasn't just to have a, have a little party. It was to give the women of Iraq a voice. They had basically been silenced and hadn't been a part of the reconstruction, which was our mission, was the reconstruction of Iraq. So, um, so to leave out over half the population and not include them in that um, seemed like it wasn't such a good idea. So that's what that, the purpose was. And it wasn't for intel gathering or anything, although there's a lot of intel to gather. Of course, yeah. But we didn't want to include that in the mission because we didn't want to endanger them. So a, sort of a community policing in a way, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, and in, in addition to speaking of that, we would we would talk to them and um, and ask them what some of the issues were. Some they would share stories, devastating stories, but then we'd also try to get them to um, come to problem solving. Like if they were having, they didn't want to send their kids to school because they were afraid of right. criminals coming in. Then we said, you know, we would talk about, well, how can you? as a community, you know, have a neighborhood watch right, right. and kind of stand up for yourself because the Marines couldn't be everywhere. Exactly. exactly. So. Now I want to talk about something that's very uncomfortable, but, but I think we do need to talk about it, and that's military sexual trauma. And it's a term that the, the military are referring to uh, unwanted sexual attention, sexual comments, unwanted sexual advances, and even sexual assault. Apparently this is an epidemic because we know that one out of three women are getting raped in the military. Mm -hmm. uh, 50% more than the civilian population. Why do you think that happens, and, and, and is this getting better? Uh, what needs to happen to, to, to combat this problem? You know, um, I don't really have any uh, answers to that, and, and I think that to really understand it, you have to understand the military culture and the people that are in it and how the tr it begins with the training of, of all the Marines. Um, I'm speaking of the Marine Corps um, because that's what I know, but but where they completely tear you down and they build you back up to be some sort of a superhero and to feel yourself more than anybody else. So, so there's this, this sort of superpower kind of sense. And then, and then we kind of have this feeling of being um, uh, like lawless or above the law. And so I think, you know, that, that has to do with a lot of it. Um, in, and then if you can imagine these... Um, these kids, they're basically kids out of, you know, out of high school. I was one too. You know, they haven't even developed the frontal lobe. And so very they... Very true, very true. Right. And so they don't have that cause and effect sort of feeling, men and women. So the women will put themselves in positions where they shouldn't. The men will think they can get away with things that they... Shouldn't get away with. Shouldn't get away with. Um, I understand that in s um, some other industrialized countries, what they do is don't, they don't let the military do the investigation. The, the, right. the civilian police does the investigation. Do you think that's one way of, of looking at this and, and resolving this problem? Yeah. Because it is a problem. I mean, it's, oh, it's a huge, it's problem. huge problem. Right, right. And, and I was speaking mainly of sexual assault, but, but um, and so is this the, the tribunal thing you're right. talking about, right? So, so I think that would put a damper on it right there. But I don't, I don't know how we get to a point where the, the constant sexual harassment, which is a, it's a daily thing that you know, women just put up with, whether the, it's worse on the enlisted side, but even on the officer side. How did you deal with that? Because uh, I know you weren't raped, but, but you were harassed. Oh, yeah. I, I, almost every woman that I speak to uh, that's been in the military has been harassed. Right, right. How do you deal with that? How do you, and um, we'll talk about that as, you, as we talk about peak PTSD. Right. Um, do you learn to cope with that? Um, you do. You just because you know I was in a say when I was in Iraq I was in a shop or an office with um, twenty men and then there was me, and and so if they're making jokes and um, you know sexual jokes that maybe I don't even want to hear or yes. find offensive, and then they turn it on me, it's not like I can stand up and right. and shout anything because uh, otherwise I'm going to be you know, thought of as an outsider. Right, I'll be right, right. You're not, you're not in the group. Right. Um, uh, PTSD, post-traumatic stress syndrome, apparently affects women more than men. Right. Um, I think it's double, 20% versus 8% men get uh, PTSD. Um, tell me how you coped with it and, and how hard it was for you to get help uh, when you first decided, I have this problem, i got to get help. Yeah. Um, 
Well, at first I didn't cope with it very well. It was more of an ignoring sort of thing. And I was very educated on it, too. Um, but um, it was very difficult. The obstacles that I came across were mainly um, just myself and the way that I thought about my role in the Marine Corps and how if I were to admit um, I would just be destroyed. I, I, it's that wolf pack mentality right. that it, the weakest is going to be chewed up and spit out. And even though the, I didn't feel so connected to the Marine Corps, it was this feeling of other, utter, like, just abandonment if I were to admit and, and rejection and, you know, beyond that. And so, um, so it wasn't easy. And I would go, I would go back and forth almost each week for probably the years 2007, 2008, where I would say, oh, yeah, you know, I think, I think I'll go get help. I think I really do have PTSD. And then the next week I would be like, oh, no, I'm fine. I don't, okay. I don't even know what I was thinking. I'm, I'm totally fine. When you, when you knew you might have it, were you in Iraq or were you back oh, home? Oh, no, I was back. You yeah. were back in, home yeah. dealing with it. Right. When did you realize you needed help? Well, I think, it, I think it came to a forefront. I was at a party in Santa Fe. This is where I lived. And there was a woman there who was half Iraqi and half Japanese. And, um, and it was known that I had been in Iraq. And towards the end of the night, everyone had been drinking She's sitting on one side, or standing on one side of the kitchen counter, and I was on the other, and there were several friends around. And she just starts laying into me about how dare you um, go over there, how dare you commit all of this, you know, violence on my people, and and um, I just think it's despicable. And 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 I kept, at first I was trying to defend myself, I'm like, but you don't understand, I, 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 I wasn't one of those people, you know, I was, I was there to, to, help. to help, you know, I, I went there to help, and and as she's speaking, I, I could slowly feel my heart was just cracking like, like an egg. Like I could no longer keep Hold it all together. It in. Right. And I left that night um, and probably just cried for like three days straight. And that was when I realized, okay, there's, there's something big going on. So that was the driving incident that led you to realize so, yeah. that night. Um, what was the most traumatic for you? Because everybody has a different thing that happened to them. In, in that Iraq, you say? That off, yeah. Um, you know, I, I don't know that there was one particular, one particular thing. incident. Yeah, my, my therapists actually say that I have, um, uh, what, I don't know what the term is, but it's like numerous occasions. It's, mm -hmm. it's, that there's a special term for Accumulation it. Accumulation of incidents. It's okay, cumulative, cumulative incidents, yeah. Yeah, and so, so it had to do with um, experiencing the Iraqi people and, and how, you know, how they were um, affected. It had losing four people that were very close to me and feeling, feeling responsible for that. Um, and, and then the incoming, you know, right around us, you know, people dying 100 yards away, you know, just working at their desk. And so there was this constant um, sense of... of Dread. Yeah, dread and fear. fear, and anytime you leave the the fob, which I did a lot to go on these missions, um, you know you're fair game. There's you don't know if you're going to come back alive. Right, right. What do you think PTSD is really? Well, um, I think it's a, a a wounding of the soul. I think it's when um, we can no longer reconcile what we thought we were there for, or what we thought we were serving for, and what's really happening. So. So when you when you see um, the d destruction and, and, and the lack of humanity involved on both sides, it just I think it's a ripping of um, of a belief system basically, and um, and I think that's why when we return, so many of us feel like you know outsiders and outcasts. There's mm -hmm. it's hard to assimilate back in, and everybody feels you know so different. And right. it's because you feel like if you haven't been through, you can't understand it. Right. 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 What are some of the behaviors that you that you had that hinted that there was something wrong? Well, um, heavy drinking. I'd isolate myself. I um, I would stay alone for you know weeks. I was super paranoid um, that somebody was trying to either get into. Um, I lived in an RV when I got back. It wasn't okay. like a trailer. Right. It was an actual right. RV with wheels. But um, but it was it was in the snow and. Um, so it was very isolated. I could I could stay away. Stay away from other people. Yeah, and then recklessness, you know, driving crazy. Um, so many things. Hyper hypertension, you wow. know. Yeah. How how long did it take before you you got help? Was it many mm. many years? I was probably. I mean, I had tried. I'd made attempts. Um, 
in the VA um, in New Mexico, they kind of um, sloughed me off as being, you know, maybe I, w I was just oversensitive, they said. And Which is amazing, and this is the VA in New Mexico. I mean, yeah. they were saying you're being oversensitive, so they're right. not they're not trained to understand. Well, this. actually, let me correct that. That was the vet center. The vet center. Yeah. Still, it's a vet center. Right, and then <laughs> the VA that they had it was a clinic, and they had a, a visiting doctor that I had to wait three months to see um, when I was on the verge of you know I don't know what. So then I waited three months, and he showed up and just wanted to give me medication and didn't understand why I thought I had PTSD, but. There was no way because I hadn't experienced combat because I was a woman in his mind, and I just left there in such rage. So, so it wasn't. It was a year and a half after I returned that I actually went to um, the Wiser program here and checked myself into the hospital. So, some of the obstacles that you faced really at first was, yeah, I'm trying to get help, but when you're trying to get help, someone right. says, hey, no, 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 you really don't have a problem. Move right. on. Which just Which, fed my doubt of, do do I really have PTSD or am I just making this up? Um, what did you do for yourself to get the help that you needed to, to get back to normalcy? Um, well, I, I... After that incident, because they said, no, no, you don't have anything. So you, you just, you didn't give up. Uh, well, I didn't give up. And actually in Santa Fe, um, I tried many, many different kind of modalities, very alternative stuff, working with shamans and doing body work and somatic stuff. And, um, and it was all very helpful, but, um, but it's still... Existed. It wasn't enough. Right, it wasn't enough. And let's talk about the WISER program. That's a okay. program here in Houston. I don't know if they have this program. I know they have different types of programs all right. over the country. Um, but tell me about the WISER program. So apparently it's very effective. It's incredibly effective. And, and I had my doubts because it, it is part of the, the Veterans Administration, and which seems to be this you know big, ugly monster, just like most government agencies. But it's run by these fabulous women and um, and it was just it was it was beautiful to be able to go unplug, not have to worry about the two year old, my husband, my fifteen year old, go there, and um, and just be with myself. Concentrate on who you are and right. what you need. Right. And they could and then they could watch me and I couldn't hide. I couldn't do that little dance that I do about oh I'm okay I'm okay, because they could see me and they you know for thirty straight days. And then we worked on skills like cognitive uh, processing theory and, and different things like that. They so. said prolonged exposure therapy. What does that mean? Well, we didn't do any of that, but, um, but that's where they expose you to the event. And then, um, but, but before they actually do that, um, that's kind of scary for me. But, but what I understand is before they do that, they give you the skills of how to work through it. So, mm -hmm. so you're re-exposed, but then you're able to, to cognix, cognitively process through it. How so. much did you benefit from learning the story of other women mm -hmm. who probably didn't have the same exact, obviously, experience that you did? Yeah. Uh, maybe they saw other things or something triggered whatever right. the PTSD was. How helpful was that? Well, it was, it was very helpful. And the interesting thing is, is that most of the women that I happened to go through with, which is apparently very rare, were all there for mil military sexual trauma. And, um, which also may cause PTSD, oh, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. They say trauma is trauma. Trauma, and I, yeah, I yeah. believe it. Um, but, but these women, um, and they were much older than me and, and sort of unexpected. So I went there um, thinking I was going to be with combat vets, and I wasn't. And... Um, and and so it was really a challenge for me. I kept thinking, oh, I don't belong here. I, you know, something's wrong. And and when I finally accepted that these women were um, were struggling with the same thing as I was, and I opened up to that, it was it was very healing to hear their stories and and for them to accept me and to validate, you know, my stories as being, you know, legitimate. how many women were in the program when you were there? I think about 10 or so. So 10 of you spent a month together every day yeah. uh, dealing with this. Right. Um, if you look back at that, what do you think was the one thing that was, and I'm sure there are many, but the one thing that you thought was the most transforming uh, and most helpful for you uh, to get back to normal life? Mm. I think it was um, at one point when I was having a meltdown and I went to talk to uh, one of the doctors, Dr. Menifee, and she sat me down and she just said, you know, you are right where you need to be and you are doing perfectly. Because I think I was, I, I always had these feelings like, no, no, it's wrong. I, I was afraid to share my story. I was afraid I'd be laughed at. I was afraid. You were afraid of the same thing that had happened to you in the past. Exactly, exactly. And so she was like, 
you, you she was just validating. You have what we call cumulative um, uh, trauma. Trauma, right? Um, and that. And that, you know, it is different than what they have, but it's actually more severe. And if you didn't understand this yet, after two weeks of doing this, this is all about validating you. You know, you were right. You were, and I don't think I ever had that. Like, you don't get that in the Marine Corps. You know, you're no, always wrong no, in the yeah, Marine Corps. Right, right. And, um, and striving to be right, so. You became involved, and we'll talk about some of the things that you've done to heal continue your healing mm -hmm. process and, and one of them is taking photos and you became involved in a book called the band of sisters women in combat tell me a little bit about that how'd you get involved well in that? um that book was written by Kristen Holmstead and um I had heard while I was in Fallujah while I was serving that that there was this author looking for photos of women marines to put on a book cover and I saw some of the photos and they were girls um combat girls, but they were, they were being a little goofy, you know, like, you know, the whole poses, <laughs> right. and, and I was like, oh, hell no, no. <laughs> we are, we are this going is not to like do, that, right. no, no, we yeah. are going to do it, and we're going to do it right, and so since I was a photographer, and I did have a nice camera over there, um, I gathered some of my women together, and we went, some of my friends, and we went and took some, and it ended up on the cover, and um, so that's really my involvement, but this book is basically 12 stories of women in combat and their different experiences. Okay. Um, you also, part of your healing process was you accepted a position in the Wounded Warrior Regiment as a casualty coordinator. Yeah. Uh, you're serving the Marines, uh, coming back, men and women, mm -hmm. uh, to adapt to, to civilian life. Tell me right. what experience, uh, what that was like and, and how did it help you as well? Hmm. Well, in some ways it helped me, um, and in other ways it was it was actually reoccurring the trauma. This actually happened way before the Wiser program, and um, uh, it was it was traumatic in the sense that um, the stories were just devastating. These these are Marines that had been out for a while, and they were at home and they were struggling, and and many of them had post traumatic stress or traumatic brain injuries, and they didn't even know it. And so I was a bit of a social worker. Um, a bit of a occupational therapist to them. A little bit of everything. Right, right. Without being trained, of course, because right, <laughs> that's right, how exactly. the Marine Corps works. Right. And um, but it it was it was very um, it was an incredible experience to be able to touch people's lives in that way that really needed and to be able to um, give them the need they needed. Maybe they needed five hundred dollars just to pay the rent or to buy some diapers for their daughter, and and I had uh, resources that I could um, tap into and, and get them that money. So basically, I would call them and do a little triage, and then, you know, and help them in any way I can, and then keep in touch with them. And it, it's the the, the problem is unsurmountable, though. It is. It yeah. is. And uh, one of the things that I always ask is, how can we, as family, and because uh, I have I have family in the military, mm -hmm. um, how can we help women and men coming back? Well, in this case, we're talking about women and PTSD, which is really not reported as right. much, and we don't talk about it as much. How can we help if, if we see someone like you, if you were my sister, and I see you're struggling, but I don't mm -hmm. understand what you're going through. How do, you, how do you coach me on how to help? Yeah, well, I think, um, I think number one is to understand that, that we won't be the same when we come back and not expect that. And, um, and everybody will exhibit it in a little different way. I, I know people that um, couldn't be around their family out of the shame that, of the experiences they had when they were over there, and their mother didn't understand. He never comes by anymore, you know. So just to be just to be patient and understanding, and that that thing that I learned from Dr. Menifee to validate, like it's okay, Very good point. you know. I Very still good point. I still love you, and educate yourselves to understand what is this PTSD, and and not just one clinical book, but you know, personal stories, um, you know, and other kinds of perspectives to really try to grasp as much as you can. And, um, and not to throw it at them, but just, just so you have the knowledge. So um, one of the things that I met two gentlemen who were in the Wounded Warrior who were uh, Navajo, and mm -hmm. they were two brothers, and they had gone over together, and they had come t to al Qaim in a very um, difficult time. It was heavy, heavy fighting. And so they had experienced a lot and came back very traumatized. And their tribe, um, after a while, it took them like six months. Their lives were falling apart. They dropped out of school. Um, called them back up to the Four Corners area, and they did a ceremony where um, they basically absolved them of the blood that was on their hands, and the community took that blood and shared it, shared that responsibility. So it wasn't all the burden wasn't on oh, them. Oh, okay. And that's one of the things 
it, it was beautiful, and it was basically miraculous by the time they got back. Right. You know, they... It's um, a ritual that's very important. Yeah, it was a ritual, but it was also the, the intention of you're not going to keep it on your hands. We're right. going to share that with you, and I right. wish we had something like that. Okay, and I, and I want to ask you, mm -hmm. how do you know you're living smart? <laughs> we reached that point already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we reached that point. I know that I'm living smart when... Um, well, my, my emotions are my indicator. So if I'm feeling good, if I'm feeling um, a flow, and if things are, are showing up for me, then, then, um, then I know I'm living smart. Well, thank you for your work. I know that you blog a lot, that you take incredible pictures, that you're a mom, mm -hmm. and that you're a survivor. And we thank you for your service to our country and, and to other women and to other Marines. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's great having you. <laughs> thank you. And... Um, if you'd like more information on military trauma, go to our website. Uh, there you'll find a complete resource list. You can also email us or call us with your comments at 713-743-8513. That's 713-743-8513. And that's our show for today. I hope you've enjoyed it. Remember to live smart. I'm Patricia Gross. Have a great week. For a transcript of this program, send 695 to the address on your screen. Please include the name of the guest.